Welcome to the Unknown Webcast. I thought I could get right into the punchline today, and that is I am so conservative that I can't turn left when I'm driving or walking. Uh, and then there's the word of caution, which I have to put out each week, that this is not a safe space for those who are easily offended by having their ideas challenged. This is broadcast number 64, and our guest tonight is Carl Teichrib, and our topic is Evolving from Transgenderism to Transhumanism. My name is Don Vino, and I'm president of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. in Wonder Lake, Illinois, which produces the Unknown Webcast, and our senior researcher is Ron Hensel, We'll introduce the sponsors of tonight's webcast. And here's Ronnie, baby. Yeah, greetings from sunny Florida, the lightning capital of the world where the palm tree saw its shadow, and now we have 12 more months of summer. Our sponsors for tonight include Jack's General Deconstruction, subverting the best to palm off the rest since 1966, Jack's General Deconstruction, and the Bible Buffet. It's not your father's worship experience, the Bible Buffet. And uh, to assure your continued access to this program, please go to midwestoutreach.org, click the yellow donate button, and continue, or I'm sorry, contribute as you feel led. If you like this program or if it annoys you and you want to annoy someone else with it, that's right, the way so, to go. So continue or contribute or continue to contribute. We could go that way too. Contribute to continue. Yeah, how, how do you like our yellow button, by the way? I, I read somewhere that that is the color. If you want to have a donate button, it should be yellow. I I thought there a lot of research went into that. And I'm, I yeah, can yeah, actually, a lot of research did go into it. I didn't do the research. We, but everything we did. do is research-based, isn't it? I, I'm drinking H2O, and I've thoroughly researched it. And that, that, that water is good, good for you, right? Dihydrogen oxide. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it'll kill you if you get it in too large a quantity. And, and too we, have, we have uh, someone who's now become a friend over a bit of time here, Carl, uh, from what was forcing change. I don't know if he still is forcing change or he's being forced to change. Uh, <laughs> but I know he's working on a book because he's sending me chapters and I – sit down and read them and i'm stretched sometimes because it's in an area that i am not as familiar with as i um might I like to be rack, that rack you have in your basement you're referring to you're stretched <laughs> it's stretched yeah yeah oh, by the way just see i put a new picture up on my wall it's like my little clock down uh and it's a, a drawing of joy and i from oh, years I, ago I, I depend on that clock don <laughs> Do you? Yeah. You How want do you me to put it back up there? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, except it's the wrong time zone for you. Anyway, back to Carl. Uh, Carl and I met at the Parliament of the World's Religions in Salt Lake City last year uh, and our uh, kindred spirits. In fact, we, it was funny. We would uh, find ourselves in the same workshops, unplanned usually, uh, where we can ask really great questions of the Wiccans and such. So, um, but he's working on a book, and in one of the chapters, uh, he was talking about uh, Martine Rothblatt, uh, and I thought we really wanted to do kind of a show on from transgenderism, which he, uh, Martine Rothblatt, is involved with, and Carl will tell us who that is in a few minutes. Uh, I got myself lost. Well, you were going to go to the Golden Face Palm Award next. That's I was going to go to the Face Palm. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to do after we talked about Martin Rothblatt. Oh, yeah, because he's also involved in transhumanism, so transgenderism to transhumanism a la Martin Rothblatt. Uh, and so, Carl, greetings to you, and we're glad you were able to join us tonight. Thank Pleasure you, to be with you, gentlemen. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, here's the thing, Don. Um, yes. When you were at this conference where you kept bumping into Carl, how did you persuade him that you weren't stalking him? I mean, <laughs> I did. I thought he was stalking me. Well, I saw a, a meme this week. You know, I don't call it stalking. I call it intense personal research. Uh, <laughs> so you can always well, use that actually, one. You know, we, we had a nice little club. There was about 15 of us or so. 
uh, and uh, we we really we really in, and we not only enjoyed being there, but we encourage other evangelicals. If you really want to know what other people believe, this is the place to go. They are open to spiritual discussions. They are more than happy to share with you. This is what I believe, and gives you opportunities to interact and ask ask questions back uh, with them. So it's a pretty interesting but, place. That's great, but aren't they like meeting somewhere in the Arctic Circle this next time? Uh, uh, is it Toronto? Like somewhere it is near, Toronto. Somewhere, it is, in the, it somewhere near in the Toronto. North Pole. It's just, I mean, just nobody shy goes the there. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody well, goes I, to Toronto. Do, do they? Do they talk funny up there, Carl? Yeah, you know, it was pretty. It was pretty difficult to, you know, to, to follow your accent. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't out and about in a boot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Tor Toronto is its own country. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. I think it is. I, I actually, I, I have actually taught in Toronto, which. Uh, which was a, a unique experience. So, Ron, give us, uh, let us, uh, what is our Golden Face Palm Award tonight? Well, uh, in a way, it's uh, the same as it is every night because our Golden Face Palm, or Face Palma d'Or, from the Festival de Candelaftel, is a prestigious weekly award recognizing accomplishments of distinction in the fine arts of slanting the facts, spinning the story, and other assorted tomfoolery in connection with Christianity or religion in general now guys okay we're looking at the cover of the most recent atlantic magazine and the cover story let's take a look at this we were doing this before the show i had a lot of fun with you guys let's continue let's ha let's show them how much fun we had with this what is the big word on this cover the big word of course is believe but in the in the middle of believe is what lie lie well so okay believe and lie are, are they talking about believing in a lie I, I, you know what that's what you might want to think but then it says how america went haywire in between believe and how america went haywire we read conspiracy theories fake news and magical thinking gee i wonder what might be included what do you think, think what might be, be climate included? change i think climate change that would climate be. change yeah. climate change this is, I, I get one vote for climate change might be included in magical thinking yeah that could how be about, conspiracy uh, theories too you know how about kim jong-un's view of the world that's magical thinking you know <laughs> that is uh, magical thinking so um Anyways, well, when we open up the magazine, we look at the illustration at the top of Kurt Anderson's story. This is this is how America went haywire. From he must read from right to left because it's, that's where the story seems to start. Uh, the Christian Church, witch burnings, UFOs, Disneyland way off in the background. Uh, the 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 Capitol building of the U.S. is is comes in. Uh, we've got the Mormon Church hippies. And of course, Donald Trump supporters in the front. How, how do you tie all these things together? What do you think is going on here? Well, believe, magical thinking. What is part of that magical thinking? Well, you know, they took a survey. They, they're always taking surveys. And they've discovered that more than half of Americans say they're absolutely certain that heaven exists and just as many are sure of the existence of a personal God. Now, here's what's so offensive about this. Not a vague force or universal spirit or higher power, but some guy. Some guy. They believe in some, some guy. guy. Okay. <laughs> this is this is a problem because some guy. You know, it's like we, we it's like that maybe they need to revise the 12 steps to, you know, we, we turned our lives over to some guy. Some guy. As we've come to understand him. <laughs> um, yeah, it's and so. Uh, <laughs> right. And yep. some guy we trust. That's going to be on our currency, you know. <laughs> uh, maybe we should change our creed to we believe and in some the guy. The father of the son is some <laughs> guy. <laughs> Okay. Well, the Atlantic is right up there. And yeah, isn't it? So, this week's winner of the coveted Golden Face Palm Award from the Candle After Festival, Kurt Anderson in the Atlantic Magazine, for depicting the Christian church right alongside the Salem witch burnings, UFOs, hippies, Fox News, Trump supporters, and belief in some guy running the universe <laughs> as the reasons America has allegedly lost its mind. 
Yes. Well, back yes. to you guys. Well, that, 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 that could be like the whole show. Okay, we're done. That was just too much fun. <laughs> Believe in some guy. <laughs> oh, God, that's editorial on you, Rich. <laughs> oh, man. We could, we could do a whole show just on some guy, I think. We probably yes. Could do that. So that the Atlantic Monthly could know who that some guy is. Well, <laughs> yeah. Oh. It's, it's, some guy who loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Already I'm running away, you know, already I'm thinking, <laughs> okay, uh, see you later. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't even like that line, so let's not go there because it could be a whole different show. <laughs> um, anyway, Carl, we didn't mean to hijack this whole thing. It was just too much fun. Some that was awesome. guy. <laughs> I'm going to be giggling all night. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, in the chapter that you sent me, uh, he's he's this book he's writing, Ron. You know, I thought our book on Gothard was a, a little bit long. Uh, this is going to be more like encyclopedic proportions, I think. This will be his life's work. Uh, but in the chapter he sent me, which is really talking about uh, transhumanism, uh, and for those who are unfamiliar with that, we've done programs before on transhumanism, but what is transhumanism for the average person out there tuning in for his first time going, what are they talking about? Transhumanism could be best defined as man looking to uh, direct and order evolution through our own technology. Uh, it is the concept that we can become more than humans. Uh, we can possibly eradicate diseases, uh, even achieve immortality through what we can do with our technology and our science. It becomes science and technology becomes the vehicle through which we look to achieve our ascension, uh, through which we can become more than man. We're going to break down the barriers. We're going to put chips in our bodies. Uh, we're going to upload a consciousness. Uh, we might be deep frozen, uh, you know, put on ice after we pass so that in the future science can resurrect us. There's a, a, a huge array of concepts and ideas and, and a lot of speculation, scientific speculation, as to what transhumanism will exactly, you know, what it exactly will look like. But what it boils down to is te technology becomes a vehicle through which we evolve, through which we change. Mm -hmm. Okay. And supposed to become as God. You, you know, okay. No, so, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead Ron. Well, the well, funny well, thing. What I was going to say is, it's, it's not necessarily all bad. Some of the no. things that they are working on is like these uh, little uh, nanobots that they can insert into your body to kill cancer, for example. Uh, so there's some medical applications that they are working on that could be beneficial. You, at, at the same time, though, if those things work, they will be prolonging our biological lives, and can the planet sustain that will be one of the questions that if I was a good progressive, I would ask. <laughs> uh, I'm not a good progressive, and so I really don't care. You're a bad that. progressive, Don. Bad, I'm not bad a, I'm progressive. Not, uh, no, I am regressive. You're a bad uh, re you're one of those knuckle, knuckle draggers, okay? I am definitely a knuckle dragger, a Neanderthalic yeah. knuckle dragger for certain. <laughs> so conservative, I can't turn left uh, hardly in my chair to look the other way. So, well, that's that, that's a nerve issue, though. Don't didn't you get a surgeon to look at that? I forgot. No, <laughs> no, <Okay>. no. <laughs> no turn my head left. It's my mindset. I am just too conservative to turn left. It prevents me from doing that. Um, but Don, you raise a good point, though. Technology itself is not necessarily wrong. We, right now, we're using fantastic technology to link all three of us together across literally the continent. So it's not the issue of technology per se. Uh, it, it, it rides into the area of philosophy and religion and, and the potential of what technology can do and how we uh, look to create some type of ethics around it. What is our ethical framework for how we use technology? And these are these are issues the transhumanist community have been wrestling with, and I think one of the biggest challenges that we're going to see in the Christian world in the next little while is just the definition of what it even means to be human, and we we will have to argue, of course, from Genesis uh, that position we are created specifically uh, as a special creation in God's image, a reflection of who He is, whereas the transhuman side is we can we can supersede that we can go beyond that we can become more you, you know this this program has already helped me in a very deep and personal way um every year i i 
Well, I, I didn't do it this year because I had to drive my son to college, but we have a talent show at our church. And every year I, I, I write one of these like Weird Al Yankovic type songs where I take an existing song and I, usually, I try to focus on technology. One year I did, instead of Rocket Man, I did Pocket Calls, you know, for when your phone, you know, uh, wrote a song about that. Um, uh, another, uh, I took uh, James Taylor's Mexico and made Technical, you know. Well, I, I, I think next year I'm going to take, I think I'm going out of my head and take, I think I've got a, a chip in my head. Well, no, they put a chip inside of my head, you know. Um, here's the thing. <clears throat> You know, a lot. We were commenting, I think, before the show. weren't we talking about how people are worried about AI and what what's going to yes. happen with AI? Yeah, Eli Musk. In fact, I had right. sent you both the article earlier this week. Uh, founder of SpaceX. I mean, he's, he's not a. He's not a, a. Well, you also have Stephen Hawking worried about this. I mean, I mean, he's right. a guy. I think I think he's piped up on it. We have, you know, AI is going to destroy us. Well. You know, it, it, every time I read these stories, it occurs to me that these people's view of the future seems to be informed by science fiction. Uh, as uh, Stephen Wright said, when he dies, he's going to donate his body to science fiction. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, okay. I, I'm, I personally am not going to donate my body to science fiction, but the the thing about this my is my body that is science fiction we we've we've actually our culture has actually been shaped by science fiction in a sense because so many of the predictions have come true you know i remember watching interviews 20 years ago uh with star trek characters that, that is the actors who played the characters and who were commenting on television how gee when we when we made star trek back in the 60s people laughed at us when they when we when we pulled out our communicators and talked to the, the uh, somebody miles away and now we're doing it every day with these cell phones we carry around um so much has come true so you might say we have a worldview that's at least partially informed by science fiction okay here's what here's the point here and that is when it comes to ai on the one hand uh we have all of these movies where we invent a computer a thinking computer and it takes over the world and subjugates us as slaves. You know, the Colossus, the Forbin project was a big movie in the 70s. First thing I thought about when you said that. Right. That was, you know, it takes over our entire nuclear arsenal and holds us hostage. Uh, it, when we try to rebel, it blows up a city, you know, okay, we better do what it says. Um, you know, uh, Terminator is based on a future where, uh, the computers that we create are now running the planet and we are trying to rebel. Uh, so, so when I hear people like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking say, we better watch it, we better watch it, we better watch it, it seems to me like they've watched a lot of these movies. On the other hand, let's move over to transhumanism. I've, there, that's also a theme in science fiction, and it also never ends well. We have... You know, you, you said transhumanism has the potential, according to its advocates, to make us more than human. And yet in every single science fiction movie I've, I've ever seen, it makes us less than human. When we become machines, you, you we end up being not even human anymore. We become, we start to think and act and talk and walk like machines and no emotions, um, and we no human values anymore. Um, so this is a weird thing. Why why aren't they heeding the warnings of the prophets, the great prophets, Robert Heinlein, Isaac Asimov, uh, Harlan Ellison, the great prophets of, of science fiction? Um, well, you know, Carl probably is, for sure is going to be better to speak to that than I am, but... One of the things that I, 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 I thought was, was interesting was that Eli Musk is concerned, as you just explained, about computers taking over. And so he wants to see some kind of uh, safeguards built into AI so that, it, so that the computers don't make us its pet. Well, that's why you have Isaac Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics, right? Uh, the, the, these, were thought of, you know, these things were thought of by the science fiction writers right. who... Yeah, they, they thought of the safeguards 50, 60 years ago. 
But. So, yeah, okay, I, I get that. But um, I, I can't think of any science fiction story about transhumanism that ends well. You get to the end of uh, Isaac Asimov's I, Robot, and we live in a kind of semi-utopia where we even have a robot running the world. Now, this, this, this is not in the movie version with Will Smith. This, I, I read the book you know, when I was in high school. It's a collection of short stories. And um, at the end of the book, it's like a thousand years in the future. We've got a robot. He's like the president of the world or something. And um, he's, 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 he's been made human enough. Ro that's in, in Asimov's world. The robots are kind of like data in Star Trek. They want to become more human. And, and they, 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 the problem is, is that they live forever or tend to live forever. Um, so, but they, but we, we kind of domesticate the robots. We give them rules to live by and they never take over. But in transhumanism, all these things where we convert ourselves into robots go in the reverse. So robots go toward humanity. Humans go toward being robots. That one never, I, I've never heard of a depiction of we are now greater than human at the end of this road. It's always worse. What do you think, Carl? I'll give you one example uh, where, where the transhuman dream is actually better in terms of, of Hollywood, Avatar, the movie Avatar. Avatar is uh, a fantastic transhumanist movie. It, it definitely fits the theme that you can upload yourself. Uh, the hero in the movie is a, uh, a handicapped, a wheelchair bound, I believe a US Marine who has his mind uploaded into this creature on this uh, distant planet that the evil capitalist America came to colonize. Right. Well, that's we what I want to do when I see those planets. I just want to colonize <laughs> them and take them over and <laughs> convert yeah, but, all their timber into pulp. But Avatar, Avatar is the perfect techno shamanistic movie. Yeah, that's that's the thing. It's of course, of course, that movie is going to portray it as you end up better than human because it's a progressive film. You know, it's yeah, uh, exactly. And and one thing I, I bring out in my book, uh, we're going to go forward with these ideas, regardless of the ethics, regardless of the morality, because it's in it's wired within us to move forward. If we can do it, or even perceive, because we can. We will do it. Uh, maybe not here in North America, but maybe somewhere else. One of the concerns I have is not that we're going to become less human by being a, you know, merging with the machine. One of my concerns, and I have, uh, in fact, I read this just one sentence out of my chapter. In our attempt to be a new species, will we act less than human? I don't even think we have to become less than human in terms of morphing with machine. We will act less than human. well i'm reading the news and i tell you we're already acting less than human yeah. but yeah we, we got a head start we're, we're on our way <laughs> okay yeah. um carl uh do you know anything about someone named uh uh jordan peterson is that a name that rings anything to you oh it sounds familiar but that's about it i would have to look look some stuff up okay because uh, a question we had from Penn Jamin is, do you have any thoughts on Jordan Peterson? Uh, it is not a name familiar to me. and uh, But, you know, that's the struggle I'm having. And, and I think why it's important we talk about this, because this is an issue that the church needs to be more aware of. Uh, you know, it, Ron was uh, talking about uh, um, kind of this transition into transhumanism, which is sort of an evolutionary thing, and how it doesn't work out in the films to become more than we are, more than human, uh, which you uh, which you have uh, also mentioned. But we have we need to go backwards a little bit to find out who are some of the players, like this Martin Rothblatt. Who is Martin Rothblatt, and how does he figure into all of this relative to both transgenderism and transhumanism? Um, yeah, okay, we'll jump into Martine. I think Jordan Peterson is a Toronto professor dealing on like free speech against political correctness, this type of thing. I've got that kind of bang around in my head. Um, I'll have to look that up. Sorry. Okay. 
uh, wheels of town turning. Martin Rothblatt, really interesting individual. Uh, I've spent some time in transhumanist events where Martin has been a featured speaker, including this little one back in 2013, the Global Future 2045 International Congress, at which time Martin Rothblatt was one of our featured speakers. Martin, if you're unfamiliar, unfamiliar with Martin Rothblatt, uh, She's the one who founded Sirius XM Radio. If you're using Sirius XM, you're using her technology. Uh, she was listed, I think, two or three years ago by New Yorker magazine as one of the highest paid female CEOs in the United States. Uh, she is very, very well known uh, within the telecommunications industry and has, uh, has done more than just that. She's also uh, started up a kind of a biotech uh, pharmaceutical company did research in uh, uh, some some diseases, uh, patented some drugs. Uh, there's there's a lot of history. She was born in 1954 as Martin, as a he, and then when he turned 40 in 1994, uh, came out as transgendered. Not the first person, but probably at that time would have been considered uh, a front runner for the movement. Somebody who who all of a sudden was in the public light, especially in the tech sector, in the public light. And uh, in 1995, came out with her book, um, which was The Apartheid of Sex, and made the claims that mankind needs to change our concepts of gender, needs to claim, uh, change our social constructs when it comes to, to sexuality, and uh, put the case forward for, for a new way of looking at gender. It wasn't until she connected in with uh, Ray Kurzweil's books, I believe in 2001 or 2002, when she took the idea of transgenderism, recognized that that itself is, is a, a one piece of a larger puzzle of transcending humanity. As transgenderism looks to transcend our sexuality, we can also trans, uh, you know, uh, move beyond our humanity and then become a transhuman. And so she became a very vocal spokesperson for the transhumanist movement movement and started, uh, interestingly, a trans religion. So you have transgender, trans religion. And, and they probably don't believe in some guy. Yeah, they, we, 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 we believe in, well, you have a, I mean, if you're transgender before you're transhuman, we believe in some guy Thing. or girl. A guy, girl, or cisgendered person? Well, uh, and, and see, that that's a, that's the thing. We were talking about this because on Facebook in 2014, yeah, 2014, they had uh, uh, had uh, set up for 71 self-identified genders, 71 on Facebook. So how many will it be once we move to transhumanism, do you think, uh, potentially, Carl? Well, that's interesting because Martine addressed that in her book, Apartheid of Sex, and, and back then, I think there's like what six six billion people on the planet or five billion people on the planet. She said basically, for every person, we have a different gender. So she was making the claim that uh, if we have five billion or six billion people on the planet, we have five billion or six billion different gender types, uh, because it's all on how you define yourself. It's not even necessarily that it's about a form of sexual expression. It is how you define your core identity built upon your your sexual representation i i don't know i mean so, it's, so it's then it's like it's like it's like having orange hair and a compulsion to tweet is that a gender uh i mean what what is what what i mean how, exactly how amorphous is this definition oh. of gender gonna get i mean uh you know I, I kind of wish I was a cat sometime. Is that a gender, you know? Uh, uh, well, you, you would be trans species at that point. Trans species. Right. Oh, but that's uh, so, but that could be a gender, right? I mean, that could be a trans well, species it's, gender. It's, it's whatever you self identify as. We tend to think in terms of transgender, uh, but you can self identify, well, like one guy who's 54 years old, self identified as a six year old female. Move back home, dress up like a six-year-old girl, uh, so and his parents take care of him. Okay. Well, I'm I'm going to self-identify as a billionaire and go to the bank, and and make a withdrawal. I mean, I I think, and then I'm going to head straight to Vegas. Uh, 
I, I hear there's some good real estate there right near the casinos. So um, yeah, this yeah. is the, was the that? itself identifies as some guy, right? Some <laughs> oh well, that's the ultimate right there. Oh, identify identify as some guy and everybody <laughs> believes in you, yes. <laughs> or at least <laughs> You know, Ron, we probably need to move into our break here really well, quickly. Don't you feel like everything is turning upside down sometimes? I mean, you know, everything, uh, you know, are you having difficulty living according to your worldview? Uh, do you need expert professional help to get reality to conform to your presuppositions? Well, then you need Jack's general deconstruction. Uh, all of Jack's work comes with free logocentrism inspection, free binary opposite inversion, and free destabilization of textual meaning. If you understand any of this, you probably really don't understand it because Jack's general deconstruction has been subverting the best to palm off the rest since 1966. Jack's general deconstruction. Okay. Yeah, we, we need to keep, uh, and don't forget to go to midwestoutreach.org and press the yellow donate button because yellow is the most researched color of donate buttons in the world. And we've determined that yellow will compel you to press that button. So just look at it and feel its power as it draws you in. And Okay, so Martine Rothblatt, uh-oh. Martine oh. Can you go with Martina? See, I never know what to call transgender people. He, she, I mean, I, I, I can you hear us, Don? I can, yes. Oh, okay, because you don't know what's going on. Well, I was on, on a wrong screen. I was doing weird things. I went, Ron, why are you doing that? But it wasn't you. It was. <laughs> what was I doing, was... Don? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying. I, 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 think I, should, I think I should be the first to know, don't you? Okay. Uh, yeah, well, okay. So anyway, back to Carl. You know, we have really <laughs> we have really kind of grasped of this whole thing, as you can tell, Carl. We're just having too much fun, especially when we get to talking about some guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see Ron and Doc some, guy, some guys in love with you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you notice, in the cover of the Atlantic magazine, uh, there was a yellow button. Go back and take a look. They have oh, it now you're going to make me go right. back. I, you're you're like, right. There was a yellow button on there. You are I right. closed that presentation. Now you're going to make me open it. Okay. I'm going to look. I don't. Okay. Um, okay. You guys keep talking because I hate Okay. This. Okay. Well, <laughs> we're, we're going to all stare at you while, while we wait and save your breath. You know, yeah. you're right. You're right. There was a... a, a uh, I you you are very observant, Carl. Um, hold on a second here. Um, this is the cover of the Atlantic that he's talking about, and there's the button, there the haywire, the yellow haywire button. Haywire. They they did their research, didn't they? Um, that we your attention. so they, they they wanted us to see that, didn't they? Yeah. And they wanted us to be so. drawn inexplicably toward it. Uh, so that okay, we good. So so now that we have kind of. Uh, talked a chewed around the edges of this thing transgenderism uh as you pointed out uh, martine rothblatt uh transition from male to female is one of the leaders of the transgenderism movement and is really arguing for just self-identity for whatever you are uh, uh and there'll be seven billion potential uh, gender identities at some point when we all become computerized, highly computerized or whatever. And so gender is not tied to sexuality necessarily. Right. It's just what you identify as. So as we move into transhumanism or the, the drive toward transhumanism, how does this impact the church? And what is it, you know, should Christians even be involved in a discussion? I know you're involved with it in part because of the question of, what about morality? How does that fit in the picture? So what is this what does this seemingly new mission field look like and how do churches prepare to interact with it? Well, for, first of all, they can't be af afraid of technology. Uh, that's the wrong approach. Technophobia. Uh, technophobia. Yeah. Right. I've seen too many, too many Christians who, who fall into that trap. In fact, I live only a few miles away from a group of old order Mennonites. We're never sure of what is the holy 
decade for technology. They have the old fashioned thrashing machine hooked up to a modern gas generator. Um, but they have horse and buggies and it's a mishmash of what is the holy technology? What is the holy decade? So uh, we run into, uh, into a danger when we, when we point to technology and simply say, okay, that's, that, that's where we draw certain lines. And yeah, there, there may be times when we, we have to do that in certain, in certain ways. Um, but I think far more important than the technology is the worldview behind it. And I think that really is a beginning point. Uh, what we are seeing is an age where we are moving into a, a, what I would call a paradigm of oneness, where everything becomes centered around man, God, and nature, becoming intrinsically or essentially one, the same. Uh, you could call it the new pagan era. Uh, some are calling it re-enchantment, this concept that, that everything is losing its identity, its boundaries, and we are all holistically coming together to do something greater than what we are. You know, blah, blah. It's progressivism uh, taken into the spiritual realm. I think it's so important as Christians, and especially churches, that we wrestle through, first of all, with what this looks like uh, theologically, and we have a firm understanding of what it means to be uh, believers in Jesus Christ and our identity found uh, in in uh, in Genesis, being created in His image, I think that's so important because if we don't, we're going to be led down all kinds of different paths as to as to potentially what our new identities may be. Whereas for believers, it's centered in the 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 finished work of Jesus Christ, and Christ alone is a salvation. Uh, it come it is our is our saving, uh, is, is our savior. Not technology, not what we can do with our hands. Uh, these are some of the things that we're going to start thinking about. How we present this, right? So, so our our identity then is grounded in Christ, not in how we feel about things. In some ways, as you were talking about this, in some ways, this reminds me of the 1960s, 70s, where all of a sudden culture was uh, some parts of culture. I want to be careful of this because the crybaby boomer generation—that's my generation, obviously—seemed uh, to have lost its its collective mind. Uh, at least the ones who had public attention. Most of us, like my wife and I, Ron and others, were too busy trying to, you know, get jobs, uh, get married, have kids, whatever, uh, uh, to do this. But you had this this kind of group. Uh, maybe the more financially upscale, who are in search for themselves, in search for themselves, trying to find myself. Well, how did you lose yourself? I mean, where did you put yourself? Yeah. Well, I hope you find yourself. <laughs> the Jammin has a question. Were you going to get to that, Don? The um, our our devoted listener, Pen Jammin. Any is anyone challenging the notion that only the subject is able to discern their the gender. gender? That's a very politically correct way. Thank you, Pen Jammin. Their gender. Um, <laughs> Notice you don't say it's gender, you, you say their gender. Uh, anyone Is anyone challenging this notion? I challenge it every time I try to find a pronoun that, or I just, I just, I just use the same pronouns. I, I'm sorry, I, yeah. I'm not politically correct. Uh, well, who, any big names come to mind? Anybody, well, you mentioned that fellow up in Toronto, right? The, um, I, I don't know, I don't really think he's challenging, uh, the ability of the subject to discern his or her own gender, or it's their own gender. He's more concerned about, don't make me call you the pronoun that you insist you must be called. Well, I don't know, because he, he falls he falls, falls up with another question, which I have often asked. He says, is anyone challenging the notion that the subject's inner sensation of what they think a gender species feels like uh, is a legitimate, necessary, referent word for the gender or species? In other words... What does it feel like to be a woman? How would you wake up in the morning and go, I feel like a woman today? You know, I, I, I talked with my wife about this, and she couldn't even really tell me what it feels like to be a woman. Feelings. You yeah, know, exactly. This, this is, you know, right? it's, it's, it's a completely subjective thing. You you know, how, how do you feel like you are this or that? I feel like... A lizard today, and someone will go. Well, that's because you are a lizard. You make me feel like a natural, you know. Or as 
Groucho Marx said you're only as young as the woman you feel, but um, <laughs> oh, God. I've, I've gone over I've, now. Out. I've totally gone over the top. But yeah, gone over the top. Yeah. getting back real quick to the question about about how we need to tackle this as Christians, uh, and specifically on the transhuman side. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think. Well, well, yeah, go ahead. The most important aspect is that we need to, to be able to compare and contrast Jesus Christ as the one who saves, Jesus plus nothing, whereas transhumanism, because it is, when you boil it down to its essence, a religious statement, which says, no, it's not Jesus plus nothing, it's Jesus plus my computer chips, it's Jesus plus my brain computer interfacing, it's Jesus plus technology, plus progressive, uh, pro progressive uh, uh, technological thinking, plus, plus, plus. This is something I brought up when I gave my, uh, my Christian critique of transhumanism to the Mormon Transhumanist Association in 2013. Uh, the, the bottom line is, either it is Christ and Christ alone, or it's everything else. Yeah, it's like we're not satisfied with Jesus. Um, yeah. Yeah, there was a, a a song back in the '70s sung by Christine Wurtzen. Uh, you know, uh, I am satisfied with Jesus. Um, and th the the fact is, is really very few people are, and, right. and probably in our in our not so great moments, we're not either. Uh, and really, the Christian life. In one way, you could look at it as is um, as a life of realizing that it's really just him. It's just it's he is it. He he is sufficient. We don't need to add anything to him. I, I I'll, I'll, I've had a lot of conversations with people who come out of a some actually they don't. I, I should say they don't come out of an ideology or something. They they're they're the Lord meets them. They become Christians in the midst of whatever it is they're doing. Right. Um, in, in one case, this guy was really into some of the weirder aspects of, um, of chiropractic. You know, I mean, chiropractic has its weird side. Uh, no. Not every no. chiropractor is into this stuff, but I guess there's this history and there's this right. one aspect of it that, you know, it's a little strange, and he was really into that. And he, he becomes a Christian, and the first thing he starts talking about is, "I want to, I want to bring these two worlds together." It's like I, I was in this really cool world, and now I found this other really cool world, and now I want to combine them. Well, you know what? I'm not. I don't want to say anything bad about chiropractic, or anything, you know. But in the Christian life, it's it's not about merging my real cool world with this other real cool world I found. It is. This is eternity. Uh, will there be chiropractors in heaven? I don't know. I kind of doubt it. You know, I think we're going to leave all that behind one day. So, you, you know, what is um, what is it that we should really be focusing on, and should we be prepared to really jettison everything in favor of Christ if, well, if it comes? You to know, we, we kind of as, as we talk about where culture is going and and the. You know how the church needs to respond or actually i would say how the church needs to, to train their people is right. to be able to as carl laid out demonstrate that jesus is the one from whom i get my identity you quoted a, a song by christine wurtson and as you did that i thought about another song that kind of shows us where culture was headed from the Doobie Brothers, we go from Christine Wurzen, where Jesus is Jesus all is just all right. To <laughs> Jesus is just all right. <laughs> they, they with me, else, but, yeah, yeah right. he's just all right with me. You know, Jesus, he's my friend. Or you have a, uh, um, what is it? A spirit in the sky. You know, never been a sinner, Going never sinned. I have a friend right. in Jesus. You know, right, 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 right. So, you know, as we as we. Like Carl and I will both be at the Parliament of the World's Religions next year in Toronto. Uh, and will there be transhumanist discussions going on up there, do you think, Carl? I wouldn't be surprised. In fact, in 2015, the very first uh, workshop or lecture that, that I think you came to, and I, I was a, as well, there was three people. Um, I can't remember the gentleman's name. He wrote a uh, an esoteric book of Enoch or something to that effect. Uh, 
Enochian magic, he talked about transhumanism, that the next phase of spiritual evolution is a type of transhumanist evolution. Uh, I think it's so important that we recognize that this is not, again, I have to reiterate this, this is not a, about the technology, it is about the philosophy and the right. theology. That is the core thing. What is fascinating is as I've been, as I've been going through my book, uh, what has hit me over and over again is mankind constantly seeks to find a technique to either uh, bridge ourselves to the divine, however that's described, or to find our way to God or to become God-like, whether it's religious rituals, whether, it, whether it's uh, magic or the techniques of the occult, there's always a technique. We're always looking to find some way. Of, or, of, or, or a way to achieve immortality without God. Right, exactly, exactly. We're doing everything possible to achieve what we're supposed to have in Christ, but without Christ. And I think the church needs to recognize that, and when we recognize that, then we can see right through whatever uh, the latest fad may be or the latest trend may be that has a spiritual implication, like transhumanism. This is really about, about who God is. I, I've got in my hand... Uh, the 1993 or 94 book, Jesus Acted Up. Um, well, show me that happened. again. That looks really, hold that little steady there. Jesus, wow, that that is, um, oh, Gay and Lesbian Manifesto. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. It was written as a Christian gay lesbian manifesto. The whole thing is about forming a, a type of progressive Christianity around your gender and your sexual identity. I'm going to read you a quote. And the very end of the quote, this is really what it's all about, completely. Queer liberation is a thoroughly erotic liberation. It is an erotic liberation from unjust, homophobic deployments of power relations. The change that is sought is not just the recognition of queer civil rights or ecclesial recognition of queers as a graced people. Now, what, what queer Christians seek is a totally egalitarian restructuring of social and cultural deployments of power. It means a radical change in how society experiences, practices, and revisions gay, lesbian sexuality, and sexuality in general. And this is where it gets really interesting. It is sexuality without gender inequalities, violence, and abuse. It is shared erotic power for lovemaking and justice doing. Gay, lesbian, sexual liberation models, a new practice, and a revisioning of God. Well, doesn't that kind of belie the notion that it has nothing to do with sex per se, that is having sex? I mean, he just used the word erotic several times, lovemaking. Right. Uh, I, I said earlier that um, I, I think I said this before we went on that yeah they're saying they're saying that you know this transgenderism thing doesn't have anything to do with the kind of sex you want to have but I'm not buying it I'm sorry I I I, I mean uh, to me you know gender used to be what sex you were and now they're trying to make it into what kind of sex you want to have or with whom. Um, and it's, it's really about the erotic in, in my opinion. And I think that just confirmed it. I think he just showed their hand. They can deny it all they want, but every time I've seen it play out, it ends up playing out on the erotic plane. And you're right. It, it does. And this is important. We have to look at, at Romans chapter one, then as our model, as mankind chooses to worship creation, not the creator. There's always a sexual cause and effect that comes with it. Uh, it is part of a curse that's, that's put upon us. Uh, we're given over to our lusts. Yeah, I think the lusts, I mean, obviously the lusts Paul focuses on in right. at one point in that chapter are sexual lusts, but then he goes on to list a whole slew of things that we're into. Right. And right. really all of them are lusts. We lust for power. We lust for fame. We lust. So really... Uh, homosexuality is just one aspect of I want what I want and you just better get out of my way or I'm going to run right over you if I have to in order to get it. That's, that's I think, the gist of the end of Romans 1. All right, but it's not just simply, I mean, it's all forms of sexuality outside of God's uh, ordained um, 
model of what sexuality is is supposed to be about because you see that with heterosexuality too where if, if you're in the way get out of the way because i'm going to pursue whatever right. oh yeah yeah i'm gonna I, I think the baby. part of this particular paragraph that are that i read and you're right the erotic part of it you can't escape that absolutely you can't just like you can't escape that in romans one but the important part of romans one and even with this statement is we're revisioning god revisioning god so oh. Looking so, to find so when we come back to it, it's, it's, it's kind of like the 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 uh, which, which Presbyterian Presbyterian USA yeah PC uh, USA doing the reimagining conferences oh yeah yeah oh yes reimagine uh, there's right no right PC the USA. same thing so in, in both cases what they're saying is I don't really like some man as he has revealed himself I want to reshape him some guy. Some guy, yeah, some guy. <laughs> I want to reshape some guy. As some guy I loves you and has a wonderful be. plan for your life. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, right. but, some girl, it, maybe. Well, you had Tony yeah, Campolo. Isn't that what, what the Atlantic Monthly just did? They they re, what, what is it, re, re envisioned or what, what was the word you used, Carl? Re envisioned God? Vision. Yep. Well, this yeah. is the thing. They've already re envisioned God. God. This is the thing. I think where they're being a little bit inaccurate maybe not intentionally but uh, uh to be let's be more i'm going to be more precise about it all of sin assumes a revisioning of god right all sin begins, all sin yeah. is already it's already been there done that bought the t-shirt right. okay uh what we are really talking about is reformulating this vision for the audience that they're trying to reach by, by that. I mean, we're, we're, we're trying to articulate and put it into words that, uh, that persuades that rhetorically persuades people to get on board with us, with this God that we have already reimagined. In fact, he, the, the reimagining of God is one who doesn't, you know, yea, has God said, did God really say, you know, if you eat of that fruit of that tree, it, it, it begins with, uh, the reimagining of a God who says thing, who may or may not have said it, but even if he did say it, it really isn't true. That's the God that we re, we that we are we are the, that is the God, the re envisioned God, whom somebody tried to persuade us and formulate a new doctrine of God in the beginning of Genesis chapter three. Uh, and they're still doing it today. We're just we just have to now figure out a way to present this God to the current generation. And and you know you're absolutely right. I I, I agree with you. Um, but and as we reinvent God, as we revision who God is in our own minds, the corollary then is we end up revisioning ourselves, reinventing ourselves. Oh, yeah. Reinventing sexuality, reinventing culture. We reinvent everything so that we stay as far away from the real God as possible. Yeah. See, that's probably the most important thing you said tonight is by reinventing God, we reinvent everything about us and around us to create a, a, actually a, a right. completely different reality. Uh, so gender is no longer biological. It is imagined and re-envisioned as to whatever I want to. I could be a dragon. Uh, and we have people actually doing plastic surgery to have these features to make themselves look like uh, uh, dragons. Or I could be a 54-year-old biologic male who self-identifies as a six-year-old female. Or um, I'd like to see the plastic surgery bill for that one, yeah. Well, no, that, that's just a matter of putting on clothes. I mean, just they dress. Oh, oh I thought, oh, well, then, you know. Yeah, no. Uh, uh, but, you know, and that, that's, that's on, that's on this, this, this kind of sexuality side. But then you have the transhumanism side where we are, and we barely touched on this tonight, uh, looking for ways to essentially download our brains, our intellect, our thoughts into a database so that I can exist separate from my body uh, as a computer program. That's where some of this is headed, is it not? Right, correct. But even with that, there's a, there's a spirituality with it. Uh, again, 
when I was at the Global Future 2045 International Congress, uh, spirituality came out over and over again. We're doing this so that the end goal is a form of spirituality. Uh, we can become as gods. That, that, that wasn't just simply a, a kind of like a buzzword thrown around. That was a, a, a real core theme. It was a core belief. I think we're all going to be uploaded one day, but it's uh, it's not going to be to the another computer. <laughs> right. In the meantime, we're looking for gender in all the wrong places. <laughs> so, but uh, that's, that's interesting, Ron, because what we're doing is we're looking to replace Christ in all things. And so when we're getting a new body, when we, when we know through Scripture we're being resurrected, if, if, we, if we disregard Christ, we're, we're still going to look to resurrect, except now we want to do it with our own hands. Uh, this is a constant replacement in every respect, a constant replacement of what Christ does. And instead, we put the onus on ourselves to do it. You know, we, we, uh, uh, we, we, have, we, we, we really need to get a new sponsor, I think. And I, I, I'm hearing, I'm getting calls now from somebody who's into Christ replacement therapy and stuff like that. So we're going to Christ replacement surgery and whatnot. Um, we'll have to look into some of these people. But we, we should probably talk uh, about uh, one of our sponsors. What do you think, Don? Um, I think so, yeah. I was almost yeah. thinking, could we change our sponsor? But Yeah, well, anyways, the uh, question is, are you tired of hearing all about the difference between the milk of the word and the meat of the word? Are you wondering when your church is going to get around to serving the ice cream and cheesecake of the word? Does your pastor take the whole Bible thing way too seriously? Well, then you need to check out the Bible Buffet. It's not your father's worship experience. Everything at the Bible Buffet centers on your comfort and your peace of mind. Everything is gluten-free, trans fat-free, and truth claim-free. And you will just not believe the delicious recipes that are waiting for you at the Bible Buffet. This week's regular Sunday specials include Aryan appetizers, Sibelian succotash, Galatian goulash, Gnostic nut salad, and Pelagian pie. And don't forget, the Bible Buffet is a fully accredited ministry of the Church of Smorgasbordianism, the Bible Buffet. Yes. I, my mouth is watering even as I think about it. You, you, you talk about the... the uh... So the challenge to the church, my my pastor, I, I go, I'll, so everyone knows, I go to Wonder Lake Bible Church, go online there, all their sermons are online there, Wonder Lake, Illinois, Wonder Lake Bible Church, but he's been doing a series on discipleship, and the title of the of one of his resource books escapes me, but a couple things came out of that. One is, uh, as the author was talking about some of the problems that the church has in this culture, is one is an overinflation of the impact that the church actually has because it, they think the church is bigger than it is. And as they have, are going through uh, surveys, what they're discovering is only about 7% uh, of uh, the population would actually be evangelical in, in theology and in belief. Uh, that's fairly profound concerning the kinds of numbers that go to so-called evangelical churches. Of course, you know, people are offended. You know, pe well, you can begin almost any topic with the sentence, people are offended. Uh, but people are offended by the notion that we might think of confining uh, the church to the evangelical church. Um, yes, it would. But, yeah. but that, that's why, you know, my caveat was, the evangelical church. I didn't say Christianity. Right, right. You know, I was we we clear. Do, I, I agree that the, the evangelical church has the proper uh, formulation of the gospel. We, we, we get the story right. Um, we're not saying that there are now saved people in other churches, but in terms of uh, getting getting the gospel correctly explained, <laughs> We've well, and, and and they're orthodox because when you when right. you start looking at other churches, you 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 know things like uh, the resurrection. They don't really understand what the resurrection is all about. Right. Uh, it, it, it's a word that they know of, and then they come together around Easter time to celebrate something they think of as a resurrection, but they don't really know what that means. Right. Uh, we probably need to have a whole episode on the title of D. Martin Lloyd Jones's what 1971. 73 something like that 
uh, sermon that he gave, what is an evangelical? Uh, the question has not gone away because people call themselves evangelicals and yet they're just not even in the ballpark sometimes. Right, right. So, you know, kind of Carl's task, and he's sort of the lone ranger out there at the moment. There's one professor that we mutually both know at this point who also is engaged in this. He's uh, a part of the evangelical the uh, um, philosophical... <laughs> <laughs> My EPS? brain is just gone. No, not ETS. Uh, uh, International uh, Apologetics Association, uh, of which I'm also a member. He he did a talk on transhumanism. Was surprised that I knew somebody else who was working on this in depth. So we got them in contact with each other. But other than these two individuals, I haven't really heard anyone talk about this, and yet. It has kind of profound impacts on culture in ways that the church is unprepared for. What I was going to say about my pastor is he, one of the things he was saying, which is something that Ron and I have been saying for years, is we need to start training people not just what to think, but how to think. Yes. We need to start at an early age when they are kids in how to understand and defend and articulate the faith. Why do we believe what we believe? Uh, uh, so that when they get into high school and then college, they have a reasonable defense of their belief system and are prepared for the onslaught that is coming in rather unexpected ways. They are going to be educated out of the faith, and transhumanism is going to be a big issue in the next uh, 10 years for sure. I think one of the important things to keep in mind is uh, – and, and I appreciated what you were saying, Don, about your pastor, how it kind of breaks down uh, some of the misconceptions we have about Christianity. One of the misconceptions that we've often had is that somehow Christians, we're going to move the culture when it's quite the opposite. The culture is moving us. And so if the culture is moving us, I guarantee you down the road, our, ch our churches will have to deal with the issue at least theologically with what transhumanism is about so that we can e equip our people to understand what this looks like from a theological religious point of view the, the cult the, the church is being blown around by every wind of culture yeah. is that what you're trying to say well it, it, it kind of is and you know and it happens on an emotive level more than on an intellectual level we right. see that happening of this whole discussion on transgenderism uh because you want to be empathetic and so you go well okay well somebody i mean they really feel more comfortable as x and you know whatever it is six-year-old female or whatever uh and and we don't want to hurt them because we're going to reach them with the gospel and so you start softening your views on sexuality instead of being able to maintain the line but once you do that you have to start sacrificing truth because at some point you have to say i'm <laughs> I think of Tevye and Fiddler on the Roof. This is like one of my all-time favorite films. Yeah. As he's going through and he's going on the one hand and then on the other hand. And finally, as he gets to one issue, he goes, there is no other hand. Right. Uh, you know, you just it's, can't move it any farther. It's a tragic point in the movie because it means he has to uh, disavow his own daughter. Right. And you don't, you don't, the audience doesn't, really have a lot of sympathy for him at that point and yet i think they kind of do because they, they they the basic understanding is everybody has their breaking point but uh when it comes to truth people tend not to be as sympathetic you know they they we can sacrifice truth if that's necessary and they're willing to discard the concept of truth if necessary in order to keep everybody happy, in order to keep everyone in harmony, uh, that in fact that really becomes the ultimate truth. Is just everybody. Why can't we all get along and you know tolerate each other? Right. So, so here's how this. Here's how I think this impacts uh, trans uh, the transhumanism question. It, that's how trans. That's how it has impacted the transgender question. Is the church continues softening its view on what even being what what a gender is. Uh, which uh, then starts softening the question of our individual identity in Christ. Now you got to deal with that. Uh, but when we get to the question of transhumanism, then 
the first thing that's going to happen is an emotional appeal that says, why are you afraid of technology? And Carl, you're not saying we should be afraid of technology. You're saying there's a spiritual, a spiritual component tied into it that we need to be aware of and addressing, right? That's right. Right. Because the next question then is uh, beyond why are you afraid of technology? Uh, aren't you aren't you about becoming better? Aren't you about becoming a a better being? Not necessarily a better human being, but a better being. Uh, are, are are you pro disease, pro death? Are you pro limitations? <clears throat> because this is about trans, uh, uh, you know, crossing those boundaries of of limitations. And that's the commonality between transgenderism, transhumanism, uh, even Martin Rothblatt's religion of trans, having a trans religion, which is called Terrasem. Uh, it, it's crossing those boundaries. It's, it's saying that those boundaries no longer hold us back, no longer define us, and no longer have, uh, have really any, any power to say what is truth and what is not. We, we cross that river. When somebody asks you, how, are you pro-death or pro-limitation or whatever, what do you say? I, I have my own idea what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say, Ron? I, I'd say, are you are you anti-reality? Uh, you know, it's like, I, I mean, we're really begging the question of what reality consists of at this point. Right. And uh, if if reality is that I can defeat death, well, you you need to show me that one. Uh, if reality is that limit all limitations are bad, well, I, I wish somebody would have imposed some limitations on Hitler, mm -hmm. uh, because you know I think we things would have gone a lot better for a lot of people if they had. So um, uh, that's you know, your, just your opinion, Ron. I know. Are you are you anti opinion? <laughs> But you raise a good point. Now, I think what it does is is it goes back to this issue of is reality, God, nature, and humanity sharing a same essence? Because if it is, then the boundaries all need to dissolve. But if reality is God separate, distinct, and utterly unique from the creation, then there are very distinct and very important boundaries. I think right. much and, and, and it really does as as much as we want to try to reimagine or reshape or create a new reality in the final analysis we're going to have we're going to it's going to be like driving a speeding truck down the road that has a wall at the end we're just going to crash into it and the it is not going to be pretty when it happens right right because the reality is if god exists as he has revealed himself in scripture if the god who raised himself from the dead by the name of Jesus Christ, who was fully human and fully God. He wasn't just some guy. Uh, if he, if all of that is true, and there's evidence that it is true, then anything contrary to that would, by definition, be false. And we're just deluding ourselves. The, the scary part about playing God, because that's what we're doing here. Uh, we're playing God philosophically, we're playing God. Uh, theologically, we're playing God. The scary thing about when mankind plays God is that we can't create out of nothing. We can't create life out of nothing. The only thing we can realistically do is play God against each other. And that typically ends in disaster. It does. Ron, um, why don't you walk us out of here? We're running over a few minutes. Pen Jamin asked how many questions that he can ask. And he, they can ask as many as they want each week until we run out of time, which we are doing quickly. So, oh well, let's then uh, give credit to where credit is due. Our resident cult leader profiler this evening was Neil. Before me, our wardrobe manager is C. How it fits you. Our tinfoil hat provisioner is just in case. Our Jehovah's Witnesses coverage comes from Armageddon and D. Opposer. Our Mormon archives manager is Polly Gummis. Liberal Denominations Bureau Chief Lucy Goosey. Our transgender issues coverage comes from Ben Hur. Our special correspondent for cults based on the Hindenburg disaster and flying turkeys is O. D. Humanity. Our fact-checking supervisor is Yoleg Pulling. Our technical assistance comes from Murky Research, and our legal advisors are at the law firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. Grievance Resolutions Director, Yvonne Pisami, our Director of Privacy Assurance is wiretapping, and our original idea sourcing comes from Drew A. Blank. 
The Unknown Webcast is a production of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. in cooperation with Emergency Manicure Productions, who are both solely responsible for this program, but you will not be able to prove that in court, no matter how hard you try. So, <laughs> and with that, Carl, I thank you for putting up with our, we just had too much fun with us tonight. It was, it was difficult to stay on subject uh, because there are so many things to make fun of. Uh, but uh, go to our website, Midwest Christian Outreach, MidwestOutreach.org, MidwestOutreach.org. We have a little donate button there. Uh, we're also on Facebook. You can like our Facebook page, Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc., uh, and we do do a, use a lot of the Babylon B memes in there. The, the freshest one is the Bible code, the new Bible code, which uh, once deciphered gives you wonderful chicken casseroles. Uh, <laughs> That's why I read the Bible. I'm looking for those casserole recipes. Casserole recipes in the code, in the Bible code. Yes. Uh, and so we will see you all next week. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Ron. And night all. And a B and a B and a B, that's all.